From the beginning of time, as we understand it, God created all life on our planet. As mortals, we have been burdened with the inevitable reality that our bodies will eventually decay and die. Like all living things, we are born and we live our existence and then our bodies cease to live. When we were created by the Lord God, Genesis 2.7, God created Adam. God breathed into the human race something different than the rest of creation. Man was given a living soul. Our original state was one that had constant communication with our Creator, and we had the tree of life within us. We, our souls, were not subject to death. God had placed us in a paradise and he had placed a paradise in us. We were in the Garden of Eden. We had fellowship with our Creator, and we enjoyed His constant presence. We were at one with our Creator. We enjoyed life without the threat of death, or without the threat of separation from our original state. As a rule to continued oneness with our Creator, we were prohibited to partake of another source of consciousness, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we were to choose to partake of this forbidden tree, then we would lose our unity with our Creator, and as the Lord told us, we would not certainly die. The fall of man and the corruption of our being was a choice to disobey God and to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve was beguiled by the serpent. The word beguiled means seduced. The serpent was Lucifer. Adam also disobeyed God, and what was one kingdom now became a kingdom divided. We lost right standing, and we lost our intimacy with God our Father and became subject to spiritual and eternal death. What started as one, the tree of life, was now corrupted with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of death. We were now a kingdom divided. The Lord God told Satan, the serpent, I will put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. So began the curse and man's need for a plan of redemption to restore him back to oneness with God. Genesis 6 in the Bible says, As the human population began to grow, and daughters were born, the sons of God, Satan and the fallen angels, had intercourse with human women, thus producing a kingdom divided by the flesh as well as spiritual separation. The temple of God, our bodies, had been corrupted by the seed of the serpent, thus producing our dual and our sinful natures. We had now become two separate things in one body, always at war with ourselves and slaves to the flesh and slaves to sin. Satan had turned our world upside down. Death had now become the rule for the human race, and the rule would not be disproved until thousands of years later through Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity.
Tree of Life is an ancient symbol. It represents the entire universe. The concept of the Tree of Life has been used in science, religion, philosophy, mythology, and in other areas. A Tree of Life is a common motif in various world theologies, mythologies, and philosophies. Also, it is a mystical concept alluding to the interconnectedness of all life on our planet and within the universe. The term tree of life may also be used as a synonym for the sacred tree. The tree of knowledge connecting to heaven and to the underworld and the tree of life connecting all forms of creation are both forms of the world tree or the cosmic tree and are portrayed in various religions and philosophies as the same tree. All throughout history are images of the serpent coiling the tree of life throughout ancient Egypt, Armenia, Assyria, Babylon, through the ancient Mayan culture, through the Aztecs, cultures from around the world have all had imagery of the serpent coiling the tree of life. The Bible is very clear and very definitive concerning the serpent's role in the corruption of not only the human race, but the serpent's role in the corruption of heavenly and cosmic events. The Caduceus of Hermes is symbolic of the serpent coiling the tree of life. As many other cultures incorporate the same agenda, the serpent coiling the tree of life represents the serpent's interconnectedness throughout life, throughout theology, mythology, religion, throughout the entire universe. It is a common scene in Christianity, the tree of life being coiled by the serpent, portraying man's descent to the underworld. As Christians, we all look forward to the time mentioned in Revelation 22, where we see the pure river, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the midst of the street, on either sides of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were healing for all the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. The hieroglyph presented in this section illustrates the hidden agenda of the evil one, or Satan. If we simply look at the cumulative sum of all the hidden images, we can clearly see that aliens or fallen angels are breeding with human women. These images completely confirm that Genesis 6.4 in the Bible is true. Genesis 6.4 states, when the sons of God had intercourse with human women, they gave birth to the Nephilim.
In the book of Isaiah, we see in Isaiah 29, 15, quote, Those who try and hide their plans from the Lord are doomed. They carry out their schemes in secret and think no one will see them or know what they are doing. They turn everything upside down. Isaiah gives us a clue to who they are. By turning the hieroglyph upside down, it is evident once again that there is a hidden agenda. That hidden agenda is the consumption of the souls of those that have been produced by the commingling of fallen angels or aliens with humans. This is clearly depicted in the bottom of the hieroglyph, as you can see an image of a man and his soul is trapped in hell. What is the matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy. I just said it would be true. Stop. Through the commingling of fallen angels with humans, a hybrid species is produced. This is exactly what is stated in the Bible in Genesis 6. In Genesis 3, the Bible says, I will put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Here, we obviously have two seeds that are at conflict with one another. The seed of the serpent takes over what was previously a unified temple, so to speak. Through the commingling, the temple has become a kingdom divided and of a dual nature. And as one gets stronger, the other dies. This is also evidenced in the hieroglyph. There is an image of a sheep with its tongue sticking out because it is dying. The other half of the hybrid is the devil. Hence we, the sheep, are dying, and the devil or the serpent is taking over our temple. Our souls are the energy that is consumed. Jesus said, any kingdom that is divided against itself is brought to desolation. Because Jesus' statement is so clear, we can easily ascertain that the abomination that causes desolation is plain and simply the alien seed or the seed of the serpent that is growing within us. As we are the temple, while one seed grows, another seed is being destroyed. That means that the evil seed is making desolate the temple of God, which is our bodies, and we have become simply a host body for the devil. Because of the commingling of fallen angels with the human race, inside the same temple exist two separate and distinctly different personalities. This is made manifest in every aspect of our daily lives. However, part of us is asleep. You could say we walk around half asleep, even unaware of the change and the transformation that is going on within us. However, the other side makes manifest its presence throughout every aspect of life. This is the world that you know.
in our architecture we can clearly see the pyramid and the representation of the all-seeing eye which is the representation of who this race of beings is. We can also see in our clothing that we wear on a daily basis that it has been influenced by these fallen angels and the resemblance of the pyramid and their god Lucifer. <laughs> We'll discuss this further as we explore the bottom side of the pyramid as we go down towards the images that are printed on the United States currency, which are also a manifestation of the outworking of this spirit of disobedience that works throughout the hearts of men. Jesus said, I have come to set the captives free and the recovery of sight to the blind in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. Throughout the entire Bible, we encounter one story after another showing the bondage that we as humans are subject to because of the fall of man. Because of our dual and sinful nature, and having another consciousness that is constantly trying to control us, we have become a kingdom divided and we are at war within ourselves. There are many illustrations in the Bible that serve as signposts pointing to our escape from this impossible form of bondage. The first story we see is Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Egypt represents the sinful and corrupt nature of our existence and also our slavery and bondage. The exodus out of Egypt represented a loving God taking his children away from the corrupt and evil ruler and leading them out of bondage. This story was a foreshadowing of the covenant of Jesus Christ that he would establish to save those who would turn from their sinful natures and turn back to God with their entire heart. Jesus' promise was to wash clean from sin and duality anyone who would accept his payment for sin on their behalf. As we look back through the Old Testament, we see one after another story showing an impossible victory. It could only be won through God and his provision for the battle. One example of this is David who fought Goliath. David represented a small and insignificant young Israelite, somewhat resembling the nation of Israel. He was willing to fight Goliath, who was a Philistine. He was also a giant and a Nephilim offspring. Goliath was also a seasoned soldier. The showdown was a representation of God, Yahweh, and his deliverance from the oppressor, the Philistines. The underlying message was that by trusting in God, an impossible victory would be accomplished. The victory would prove that an unforeseen force was most certainly behind the scene, ensuring the victory for those that were weak and had little to no chance of winning the fight. The Battle of Jericho and Gideon's battle and many others would epitomize the victory that would later be won by Jesus Christ on our behalf. We were all slaves to sin and we had no escape from our wicked master Satan, but Jesus Christ would win the battle for us and we would be set free from our sin. <laughs> In this section, we will deal with the person and the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. But before you believe in Jesus Christ, you must believe in your heart 
that he was God's anointed, God's chosen, to come into the world to die for your sins personally. However, many people stumble and fall at this point because of disbelief and because of unconfessed sin in their lives. At this point, I would encourage everyone that continues to watch this video to make an appeal to God for a clear conscience. You can do this right now as you sit there, as you watch these videos. Simply ask God to clear your conscience and confess any sin that you have that might be a stumbling block in your ability to understand and perceive God or to simply hear His still quiet voice. The following is a letter that was written as one person made their way to Jesus Christ and took hold of the reality of their position in Jesus' death on the cross. Please take this moment to reflect on yourself, reflect on your own sins, and reflect on the duality that you've been shown thus far in these videos, and realize that it's your duality that has kept you from knowing the Lord or from being able to receive Jesus Christ. Before we begin, I'm going to read a letter that might help you understand more clearly what one person's revelation looked like, and this letter will be their outpouring of their heart as they took hold of the reality of Jesus Christ and who he was and his position in their life. Dear brothers and sisters, this letter is much a confession as it is a testimony. It is a letter to God. O oh my Lord, my God, deal with my rebellious heart. Deal with my heart, Lord, at the foot of the cross and at the trail of the blood and the agony that beckons the heart of each soul that has been called to you. O oh, merciful God, please deal with my rebellious heart. My rebellious heart saw others for the reason for failure. It blamed others for its own unhappiness. My rebellious heart accused others of what itself was already guilty of. My rebellious heart lied to itself in any and every manner of justification. There it stood confidently at the end of a long, torturous walk, watching the one carrying the cross. My rebellious heart pointed its finger and accused the heavy burdened one. As Jesus was nailed to the cross and lifted up, my rebellious heart hurled insults and accusations and took self-righteous gratification in the illusionary justice of the condemnation of Jesus. And then, out of perfect grace and perfect love, the miracle of all miracles. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus prays for forgiveness for the ones that are his enemies, especially me. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. His joy came from making us whole again through forgiveness. Oh, the joy. Oh, my Lord, my God. Your perfect child looks with compassion at those who hate him, and he offers to take their place. The joy was in the forgiveness, and the miracle of all miracles happens. Those that had condemned themselves, they are redeemed. The one that was sinless, he becomes sin. The ones that were evil, they become sinless. The ones that were stained become spotless. And the one that was spotless is stained in the blood of the sins of the rebellious. Prisoners are released from dungeons that they themselves have created. The blind are given their sight back. And the author of life bows his head in submission to the will of his Father in heaven. 
Oh, my Lord, my God, my Savior, thank you for having let me receive you. I humble myself before you, and I confess that I, I am any and every one of those that sought to destroy you. But you love my soul with an unfailing commitment, and I will praise you every day of my life. No matter what the circumstances, the battle must be fought in the human heart. And I know that we only win when we surrender. When we surrender our hearts completely to you and the sacrifice that you made on the cross to redeem us, now your words ring out like pure, unadulterated truth. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Production of a hybrid species on planet Earth would ultimately require an eventuality in which all humans would eventually fall and succumb to the hybridization of the new race. Once the new race had reached a point of physical transformation of the human temple into a fit extension or a host body for the new race, then a new world would emerge in which the new race would rule by a new government, initiated by the leader of this new race of hybrid beings. Satan would rule the kingdom divided and would deceive the inhabitants of the earth into a new world government that would be established through lies and deceit. As this new race of beings began to emerge within the normal populace, the new government would emerge also, a government based on deceit and lies and manipulation. This new government would have to find a way to control the masses into believing that they needed legislation put in place in order to combat terroristic events and activities that threaten the life and the survival of themselves and their country. The Twin Towers, the Pentagon, the Federal Building are all images of bombings on the U.S. currency that actually happened this shows that the new race of beings was not only devising the schemes, but also flaunting it and mocking those who they seek to enslave by printing the images within the U.S. currency. Because of these bombings, new legislation was enacted. The Patriot Act, the Enabling Act, is the same legislation that Hitler passed during the rise of Nazi Germany. The United States government would follow accordingly, enacting the same legislation that Hitler had enacted. The Patriot Act would also serve to control the masses by giving the government more power than the government actually needed. Further bombings would also increase the government's ability to further enslave the masses through the signing of more legislation the National Defense Authorization Act, along with the National Defense Resources Preparedness Act. All these new legislations were designed specifically to enslave the public and giving the government far-reaching powers to where the United States citizens would not be able to rise up and argue with the newly established laws of the land, therefore enslaving the masses.
behind the curtain was a haunting reality that the images of the bombings of every building in the United States were printed on US currency notes. This was almost unbelievable, unexplainable, but the reality of the images being there were also unarguable. When one takes the image that's on the US currency and matches it with the actual bombing of the building itself and lays it on top of that image, you have a complete and perfect match. This would set the stage for future bombings that were also printed on U.S. currency notes. The Hoover Dam, as well as an offshore nuclear attack on New York City, would be the next on the venue to enslave the masses and bring about the New World Order, the New World Government run by Satan himself. As part of the evil cabal's code, they must first publicly present their plans before doing them. As previously seen, all the bombings in the United States have been shown ahead of time by having images of those bombings printed on U.S. currency notes. In keeping with the satanic code of mockery, the new satanic rule would announce their plans publicly. Barack Obama's acceptance speech at the Denver Broncos Stadium was one such public mockery, but the significance remained hidden from the eyes of those who live in total darkness. The altar where the president stood was an exact replication of the seat of Pergamum, the seat of Zeus. This is a direct reference to the Bible referring to the seat of Satan. Mr. Obama gave his acceptance speech on a replica of the seat of Satan, suggesting that he, Satan, would take his throne at this time through the fit extension known as Barack Obama. The stadium also displays prominently an image of a white horse, once again alluding to the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. Many public displays, such as the Super Bowl halftime show, are merely in reality a satanic ritualistic ceremony, mocking the enslaved masses of deluded sheep. As Madonna took center stage at the Super Bowl, she stood on top of her throne, striking many interesting poses, many resembling the former goddess Ishtar.
Her throne also resembled the Hoover Dam, also suggesting the destruction of the Hoover Dam as printed on the $50 bill. All of these public rituals and satanic displays are all the eventuality of the rise of the second beast out of the sea of humanity. The stunning resemblance of Barack Obama to Akhenaten is irrefutable. The reality that an alien is standing in the body of Akhenaten is also easy to perceive in the hieroglyph of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. The rise of the beast or the alien would again find a fit extension in Barack Obama as the restored temple of the beast. As the beast would take his position as ruler, and the fake war on terror enslaved the masses, the beast would rise to power out of nowhere, and he would rise to power on a global scale. A junior senator with little to no experience would seize the throne of the most powerful nation in the world. Through his promise of peace, he would go out and conquer and beguile the masses. States is disgusted that a couple members of this council continue to prevent us from fulfilling our sole purpose here, addressing an ever-deepening crisis in Syria and a growing threat to regional peace and security. Even more shameful when you consider that at least one of these members continues to deliver weapons to Assad. The new ruler of the kingdom divided would even scoff at the most high God, Yahweh. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. Folks haven't been reading their Bible.
To understand the significance of the destruction of the Twin Towers, one must first understand the reality of the two different species growing together like twins. The parable of the wheat and the weeds in the book of Matthew illustrates the two different species growing together. The destruction of the Twin Towers was Satan's declaration that the twins were gone and that the two had become one as evidenced by the building of the One World Trade Center. The One World Trade Center's architecture represented an upside down seed joined together with the right side up seed, thus forming the new race in one new body thus representing the forming of the completed human race in the form of a hive controlled by the spirit of Satan. As God himself had taken on human flesh in the form of Jesus Christ, Satan himself would also take on flesh in the second beast, Barack Obama. Through the destruction of the Twin Towers and the tearing down of what once existed, the building of the One World Trade Center would represent Satan's recreation of a temple in which he would sit as the king. The co-mingling of the serpent seed with the seed of the woman by signing an 11,000 pound steel beam and by writing the words, we remember, we rebuild, we come back stronger. Satan would scoff at the Most High God, Yahweh. The statement would reflect Satan's defiance towards God by claiming his temple had been rebuilt and that the two had become one through the intercourse with human women. Gospel of Luke, we are admonished to keep watch for the arrival of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We are told that we will see signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. of Matthew, our Lord Jesus tells us there would be earthquakes in diverse places and there would be wars and rumors of wars before his arrival.
He told us to be aware that when we saw the abomination that causes desolation, we would know that his arrival was imminent. still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The revelation of an alien seed within the human temple is the abomination that causes desolation. That alien is the abomination and it makes desolate the temple of God, which is our bodies. As was the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. As stated in Genesis 6, the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for he is mortal flesh. The time is upon us where the Spirit of God will cut off those who wish to be saved, and the open door to escape the destruction planned by God will be shut for those who reject him. creatures just dropping dead. What you're about to hear is a re-recorded prophetic utterance that was given to me in 2007 and 2008 before Barack Obama became the president. Behold, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the hand of the oppressor has been lifted against you, and out of the sea shall come fire and smoke and a devouring wind. Water as high as the walls of Jerusalem will cover the city by the sea, and great shall be the destruction of that city. Behold, the great wall, which holds back the abundance of the rivers, shall burst forth, bringing the hand of the oppressor against you. For I have seen it, says the Lord. For mighty is your enemy that is risen from within your own borders. Now behold, the abomination of desolation spoken about Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place where it should not be. Here is the mystery made known to you. You are the holy place of which I speak. And the abomination of desolation shall rise from within the walls of the temple to destroy the temple. For have you not seen? Have you not heard? Has it not been made known to you? Have you not read the scriptures? For when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they did bear children to them, and the same became mighty men. Has not the sea turned mighty? And the sea shall turn terrible before your very eyes, and the terrible one shall be elevated within the sea. And behold, the man of peace, Barack Hussein Obama, shall come forth from the sea, and with words of peace he will bring chaos and destruction. Behold, the fig tree puts forth its leaves, and suddenly the time is upon you. The travail begins, and it will not stop until the holy nation is brought forth.
Hopefully after watching this set of videos, you have been awakened to the truth. This planet has been hybridized and has now fallen to the ruler of this new race of beings. Satan has used his invisible army and the human race as slaves to build a world in the image of Satan himself. His signposts are everywhere and on almost everything. signposts are everywhere and on almost everything even the automobiles we drive resemble serpents now that you have seen the truth by turning everything upside down it is your chance to appeal to God your original creator for a clear conscience to be set free admit your sinful condition and that you know you need a savior to wash you clean of your sins and clean up your duality look at the cross that Jesus went to as your key to freedom. Turn it upside down and accept Jesus as the truth and the payment for your sins. Repent of your sins as if they were putrid filth that you no longer wish to abide in. Thank Jesus for his suffering on your behalf and know that in your heart he was raised from the dead, then through faith by grace. You're saved. Now let Jesus live in your heart and do as he would do in everything you do. Now if you're getting this message and millions of people are missing and Obama has risen to global prominence and power, then you know that all this has been true. Find a Bible and turn to God with your whole heart at this time. For there's little time left for the great tribulation to be carried out. All that remains is death and suffering. Turn to God with your whole heart. Convert as many as you can to Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to give up your life. No matter what, do not take the mark of the beast. Revelation says anyone who takes a mark will be guaranteed eternal condemnation. So when your time comes, don't be afraid because death is the key to leaving here. Death is actually the door out. But don't be afraid of death because now life lives in you. Jesus Christ is life. And if you have the Son, you have life. Whoever has a Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So if you're faced with your own death, don't be afraid, because that is the exit out of here and into eternal life.
after watching all these videos, I sure hope that it has found a place in your heart, the reality of what you're looking at. I, I gave up my life in 2002. I got saved in an alley um, behind the St. Anthony Hotel. And uh, I got saved and I was in the presence of an angel when I got saved. I was called as a messenger and I was called as an end time harbinger to warn people about the imminent destruction of the earth in flames. The entire ministry I've been given by the Lord is to try and shake people awake with this information so they can wake up and they can make a profession of Jesus Christ so you can get saved because um, for what's coming nobody and I mean nobody is going to be able to protect their lives nobody um, so if you'll make the step towards Jesus Christ and accept his payment on the cross for your sins I guarantee he'll make the step towards you to receive you as his child and uh, once it happens you'll have an undeniable connection to the Lord that you never had you'll feel his presence within you because he's a supernatural spirit our Lord the Holy Spirit he ex you know there's God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will take place in you and he'll he'll take up residency inside of you and he'll take your duality and fix it and he'll instead of being double-minded and struggling with sin all the time you'll be able to overcome sin and you'll be of a single mind and um, that's what this is about I want you to know that I've given up my life to get this information to y'all um, and I've suffered dearly for it I've suffered the loss of many 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 things I pray just in the name of Jesus that you keep your heart open to this and and that you look into it yourself and, and seek out the answer because you know the Bible says when you look for Jesus with all your heart you will find him and there's a time coming and uh, if you're hearing this and you're in the great tribulation then you know you need Jesus Christ otherwise uh, you got nothing and you're gonna die a horrible death probably and you're gonna go to hell well even if you die a horrible death you can guarantee yourself a place at the Lord's table for all eternity and I, that's a guarantee um, that's one thing I can guarantee you so I would uh, make the plea uh, please in the name of Jesus Christ turn back to your father you know who is God and turn away from your enemy the devil who uh, who wants to destroy you that's it thank you for listening we are brought in and invited near to share his heart you come into his presence totally broken before the reality of what he has done for you I don't deserve this why have you done this for me I love you I have a commission for you. For me? You want to have me work for you? I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you, just tell me. I need you to go back to that prison cell that I took you out of. Because there's a whole bunch more that need to know about me and my love and my truth. Will you go for me? In a heartbeat, I would, I would gladly serve you any way you want, any way you ask. I need to forewarn you, I'm going to send you out, and you'll be as a sheep among wolves. They'll kill you. They'll destroy you. They'll hate you. They'll persecute you. They will do whatever they can to harm you. I'm in. I'll do it, God. I don't care. You shed your blood for me. I would gladly shed my blood for you. Take my body. Take my blood. Spend it any way you want. I belong to you in, in covenant. Take me, Lord Jesus. Send me the commission, not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son and a daughter of the King of Kings, but we are commissioned to represent him. And I want you to realize that it's a privilege beyond all other privileges to bear the very name, the very image, the very reputation of God Almighty. And he says, I ask you to go. Go and make disciples of all men. Go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it. Go, rescue the lost in the power of my name. For is not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the reward of his suffering? I'll go. And as you're beginning to head out with his blessing, he says, Holden, wait, there's one more thing. 
Not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as the son or a daughter of the king, and not just the commission. This is the capstone. If you think that is all good, you could wrap that all up into one ball and it still falls short of the final one. Because this final one is so condescending on the part of our king. It is so bewildering. It is so extraordinary. It's so amazing. And this is the truth that turns the world upside down. Before you go, what I'm sending you out to do is impossible. I know. Impossible. And if you do it in your own strength, you'll fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. And if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make it my home. And I will take those hands of yours and make them my hands. I will take those feet of yours and make them my feet. I will take that mouth of yours and it will speak my words. I will take those eyes of yours and they can now see what I need you to be seen in this world. And I will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh so that it will beat with my burdens and you will care for the very things that I care about. And your prayers will become my prayers. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. Will you allow me to overtake your life? Because then we go into this world as little lambs with the faces of lions. Because the living God Almighty, the consuming, almighty, sovereign God dwells within his children. And as we stand and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority in the name of Jesus and we will not back down. Because we do not head off to war to lose. We head off to war to win. Our God mocks all the powers of earth and hell through fluffy little lambs. Because his lambs beat the wolf pack. That's the gospel. The gospel trounces upon all the powers of earth and hell and demonstrates to the universe the manifold wisdom of God that he is in control. And even though we look weak, and even though physically and naturally we are weak, spiritually greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. That is good news. And it is a lot better than what's being dealt out today in the church. We need to rise up, proclaim the gospel, and say, I'm unashamed of it. Dear Lord Jesus, take what is rightfully yours. Don't just send us. Send us with yourself. Firmly planted within our souls. We cannot do your work. We cannot bring you glory. Even though we're willing to do it without you. Please, if you want to come with us, why in the world would we ever try on our own? You don't have to go on your own. You don't have to pull off the impossible on your own. You don't have to fail any longer. Your God is ready to do it in and through you. You can't do it. You can't muster up the discipline. You can't muster up the intellect. You can't muster up the strength. You can't muster up the perseverance and the fortitude. He can. You can't love the lost. You can't love those that spit upon your face. He can. Don't pray that God would teach you how to love like he loves. Pray that he would fill you with himself and he would love in and through you. Don't pray that he would teach you to have joy. Pray that the living God full of joy would enter into you. Don't pray that he would teach you how to be peaceful. Ask for the God of peace, the Prince of Peace to infill you. Because if you try and imitate your own strength, you will be a miserable replica. But if you allow the impartation of Jesus Christ to overtake you, suddenly it all works. Because it's him imitating himself. And he's very good at being God.